Good morning, everybody. Um, good to be here in Ohio. And um, love how close your telephone poles are to the road. <laughs> it's like, I felt like I was back in Ireland or something. My wife is with me, Clara. She's gone right now, but she's, oh, there she is. And we have celebrated our 40th wedding anniversary this week. So, we're leaving here and going up to Niagara Falls. That's where we went on our honeymoon. So we're finally going back. I'm looking forward to that. We have 11 children. We have 24 grandchildren. I pastor Mercy Seat Christian Church. I've been pastoring there for 33 years now. If you want to know a little bit about what Christ did in my life, I have a website. And I have cards that I put out. They're on the back table, too. Um, but I put these out and all over the place. And the website is howjesuschangedmylife.com. And it's a remarkable story of the work Christ does in a man, how he transforms us by the power of his Holy Spirit. I am honored to be here. Um, I view this as the most important conference I'm speaking at this entire year because of the title, because of what is being promulgated here. Um, so I'm honored that Michael asked me to speak at it, and I hope what I have to say is a blessing to you. I think we live in exciting times. I mean, a year and a half ago, we were just dying slowly on our wealth and ease. The Americans were dying, the church was dying on our wealth and ease, but God's brought his judgment. He's unleashed the tyrants upon the land. And that doesn't mean we don't confront them, but it means we understand his judgment is just, and he's using it for his purposes in the earth. Extremely important to understand. And in the midst of it all, we get to bring Christian thought to Americans regarding civil government matters. And that's massively important that we do so. One of the biggest things that's going on is for years I've told people, forget about Washington, D.C., get off the little hamster wheel, you know, of the next president and the next Supreme Court justices and get involved in state, county, and local politics. It was like talking to a cement wall. You couldn't get people to do it. But what's gone on over the last year and a half with so many different things that have gone on over the last year and a half People have poured into involvement in county and local government because not only do they realize that their federal government is at war with them, they also realize that most of their state governments are at war with them also. And they understand the importance of gathering at some lawful body to make a stand, to resist, to interpose against the evil of governors, against the evil of the federal government, federal judiciary on down the line. So I'm thanking God for what's going on. Amen. It is important for us to understand how important county government is. These intermediary governments were meant to check lawless acts by superior authorities. They were not meant to be mere implementation centers of bad federal law policy and court opinion or dictatorial edicts by governors. Their duty was to check the evil that they were doing. Our founders wanted a true federalism established, and that is what they established for this country. In a true federalism, you have multiple levels of government, multiple branches on each level, so that if any one branch or branches begins to play the tyrant, another branch or branches will check that branch or those branches. That's what they expected to take place. And they did this because they had a Christian view of the nature of man. They knew that man was wicked and in need of a savior. So they didn't want power to reside in one man like a monarchy, and they certainly didn't throw off a monarchy to replace it with an oligarchy like SCOTUS, like the Supreme Court has become. So this morning, I actually want to begin by talking to you about meeting with the magistrates. Meeting with the magistrates. So if you could, let's stand and I'll pray, and then I'll get into this. Father, we rejoice in you and thank you that we can gather together. And we just ask and pray that you use this time for good. Help me to set forth that which you put in my heart to declare. Put a fire within the heart of each person here. Use what's said 
for good in the mind of each person here. May they see their duty in this hour. May we live to glorify you through our lives. We thank you for your redemption through your son, Jesus, that you redeemed us not with corruptible things like silver or gold, but with his precious blood. Be glorified here and through our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You can be seated. A popularly held belief amongst Christians in America is that the early church had nothing to do with civil government or politics. And this is huge. They don't want you involved in civil government or politics. The churchmen don't. The form of Christianity that we have throughout the West and here in America, they don't. And they've even pillared these little um, slogans. They have many of them like, um, we should just, you bring up a civil government matter, they say, we should just preach the gospel. Or we should just pray. Or I just expect sinners to act like sinners. Or God's got this. <laughs> you know, all this kind of stuff. And so they've pillared these little things. You have to be able to dismantle those. Because what they're meant to do is neutralize you. They're meant to throw a wet blanket over you so you feel unspiritual. And so that you get back in line and have nothing to do with civil government matters. So just one example. The example of just preach the gospel. Dismantle it. Respond to them and say this. Well, first off, that is a myth. Nobody just preaches the gospel. Do you ever spend time with your wife? Do you ever play with your kids? Do you ever use the restroom? Nobody just preaches the gospel. Secondly, you need to be able to tell them, notice when they say we should just preach the gospel. Like no one says um, when the next potluck's announced, wait a minute, we should just preach the gospel. <laughs> or when the church softball team's being organized, no one leaps up and, oh no, we should just preach the gospel. It's only when you bring up civil government matters that they say it's meant to neutralize you, it's put a blanket over you, make you feel unspiritual. It is a popularly held belief, and we're reaping the consequence of Christian men having abandoned the realm of civil government. I'm glad Michael talked about missions because the greatest mission field in America is the magistrates, and you must do mission to the magistrates. Massively important to do. So there's this popularly held belief amongst Christians in America that the early church had nothing to do with civil government or politics, but nothing could be further from the truth. Not only did the prophets speak to the magistrates, not only did Jesus speak to the magistrates, but the apostles also spoke to the magistrates. And even a brief perusal of the writings of early churchmen known as apologists reveals that almost all of their writings were directed towards the state officials. They were written to Roman government officials, the magistrates, the rulers of their day. That's who they wrote to. Didn't matter if it was Justin Martyr, Athenagoras, if I'm pronouncing his name right, Tertullian, they all wrote to either the emperor or to the governor in which they resided. They understood the importance of Christ's message that yes, it's to the individual, but it's also to nations. Extremely important. What prompted the writings of the apologists? Persecution did. And suddenly we're seeing many Christians, thanks be to God, get infused in civil government matters because of what in our day? Persecution. Persecution, God uses it for his purposes in the earth when he has a dead church that he needs to chastise. We must not ignore the civil magistrates, as so many in American Christendom are wont to do, under the guise and false belief that the early church never had anything to do with civil government or politics. The early church did have something to do with civil government and politics. The early church did not ignore the civil magistrates. They wrote because of their love for Christ and for neighbor, and it affected public policy. It transformed the Roman Empire and went from there. I can assure you, pardon me, the Lord speaks to all matters of life, and that includes the area of civil government. And we must instruct the magistrates from the word of God regarding their role, duties, functions, and limits. That's what we have to do as Christian men. And this is the history of Christianity. Not only did Christ, the prophets, the apostles, the early churchmen, the apologists, but the missionaries of old also went 
and delivered the word of God to the magistrates. I totally messed up on my thing, didn't I? On <laughs> my PowerPoint. If you want to ramp it up, go ahead and ramp it up and move it up to the missionaries. Sorry about that. I was going to do a little thing on the doctrine because I ran into so many people who don't know, weren't familiar with the doctrine unless they're magistrate. I'll do that after I get through this other part. Sorry about that, John. He's helping me out with that, and I appreciate that. We have so many examples of the missionaries, the early missionaries. They went to the people, but they went to the magistrates. Columba set up his mission in Iona, the island of Iona, and went into the land of the Scots and the Picts, endangered his life in order to bring them the word of God, to bring him law and his gospel. And they all, he also spoke to the magistrates. And as they embraced the teaching of Christianity, it impacted their public policy. Their laws, their ways were drastically transformed. You look at Patrick, who went to Ireland. He had been a slave there before. He knew the customs of the people. He actually, against the law, started a fire on a hill on a day no fire was to be lit precisely to be arrested by the magistrates, taken to the chieftain so he could present the word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ to the chieftain. And he was arrested and he was taken there and the chieftain wasn't one to Christ, but he did give Patrick permission to declare the gospel, declare his message of Christ in all his realm. This was what the magistrates did. This is what the early missionaries did. Look at Boniface, who was already spoken about here. Boniface won the Germanic peoples to Christ by cutting down the Oak of Thor. He routinely instructed the magistrates of his day in good and proper governance. Again, the teachings of Christ transforms the public policy of nations. It's all encompassing all, and it wasn't just the missionaries, it's also the early churchmen. Remember Leo, the bishop, when Attila the Hun showed up, he actually went out to Attila because everybody else was afraid to had a conversation with him outside the gates of Rome until it turned around and left. We do not know what he said, but it was the bravery of a churchman meeting with a magistrate on an actual field of battle that spared Rome from annihilation and complete slaughter at that time in 452. You look at Tiridates III, who was the king of Armenia, won to Christ by Gregory, a churchman, Armenia is the first nation to embrace Christ as a nation. And it was because of a churchman who understood, no, I shouldn't avoid the magistrates. I need to go speak to the magistrates. You look at Alfred the Great. We are still impacted by what he left here. Alfred the Great had a huge impact upon Western civilization. That's why he's called the Great. He was surrounded by churchmen. He carried the law of God in his pocket like Josiah of old. His closest churchman who instructed him was a churchman named Asser. The churchmen understood we speak to the magistrates. They understood the three great governments, family, church, and state, and they knew that the church had a duty to speak to the state regarding its governance, regarding their duty in the sight of Christ. So the history of Christianity is a history of Christian men instructing the magistrates from the word of God as their role, duties, functions, and limitations regarding their office. The Protestants were no different. The story of Nicholas von Amstorf is phenomenal. We have the Magdeburg Confession back there. It's the first time the doctrine of the lesser magistrates was actually formalized as a doctrine by Christian men. It had been practiced from in the Old Testament, practiced by the New Testament, his, history of the New Testament church for 1500 years, but it had never been formalized as a doctrine until the Magdeburg Confession. We secured a 1550 original in Latin, translated first time ever in nearly 500 years since it was written and have published it. It's sold about 12,000 copies now. George Grant wrote the foreword for it. I put in a historical prelude and postscript and we put in all kinds of footnotes so that you understood, because if you don't understand what they're referring to, sometimes you don't get the punch of what they were saying. Extremely important. Nicholas von Amstorf was a protege, close friend, confidant 
of Martin Luther. He was there at Wittenberg with Luther. He was there when he posted the 95 Thesis. He was with Luther when he was in Worms. He was with Luther when he was abducted by Frederick the Wise, a lesser magistrate who was directly under Charles V and was told to arrest him because he was going to be executed. And instead, the lesser magistrate feigned Luther's arrest and hid him in the Wartburg Castle where he stayed for a year. Nobody knew he was alive or dead. And he translated the New Testament into German, giving the Germanic peoples their first unified language ever. And it was the word of God. Nicholas von Amsdorf, in 1524, Magdeburg, Germany, became the first city to embrace the Reformation. Luther thought so highly of Nicholas von Amsdorf, he put him in the pulpit there. The magistrates and the people sat under his preaching for over 20 years. And when Charles V decided to finally make his move after Luther died to crush the Protestant Reformation, only one city stood in interposition. It was the city of Magdeburg, Germany. The magistrates knew what their duty was in the sight of Christ. And people rallied there. It was a 13-month siege. 468 Magdeburgs were actually killed. About 4,000 of Charles' men were killed. But in the end, they won. If it had not been for the interposition of that one city, the Reformation may have just been a blip on the radar screen of human history. That's how important their interposition was. Will Durant, I love history, said this, he said of the Reformation, he said, in Protestantism, the preachers became journals of news and opinion. They told their congregation the events of the week or day and religion was then so interwoven with life that nearly every occurrence touched the faith or its ministers. They denounced the vices and errors of the parishioners and instructed the government as to its duties and faults. It's the history of, Amer of, of Christianity. We talk to the magistrates. We bring Christ's word to the magistrates. Osmond, Stephen Osmond said this. He said, reform that existed only to the Protestant reformers. He said, reform that only existed only in pamphlets and sermons and not also in law and institutions would remain a private affair confined to all intents and purposes within the minds of preachers and pamphleteers. And that's what we've had for a long time. Everybody living in their little hovel and the churchmen in their ivory tower separated from the world. And we've created this awful thing called pietism. And I mean that with a capital P, not piety with a small p, pietism. At our website, defytyrants.com, we have a whole section on pietism. I encourage you to read the articles there and listen to the lectures. So let me say this. The prophets, Jesus, apostles, apologists, missionaries, churchmen, they all engaged the magistrates. And yet, Christianity throughout the West in America have abandoned them for decades now. And we're reaping the whirlwind for it at this time. The scriptures make clear his word and kingdom are so, are to impact the nations of the earth. The early church fathers taught it as so, the apologists, the missionaries, everywhere. His law, word, and gospel were intended to impact the nations of the earth. And this is why Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. His final command was, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And Paul said his ministry was, quote, for obedience to the faith among all nations. This is why Christ declared by John, he's declared by John to be, Christ is, quote, the ruler over the kings of the earth, unquote. Contextually, this was declared to be so when John wrote it, not to be applied off in the sweep by and by. Paul says of Christ, quote, who is the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, 1 Timothy 6.15. Paul uses the present tense as there won't be any kings or lords in heaven. In Psalm 2, a messianic psalm for telling of Christ, the father says to his son in verse 8, quote, ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. Christian men down through church history understood that the rule of Christ extended to all the nations of the earth because of what the scriptures declare. To think that the law and word of God would not impact nations was an absurdity to them, yet it's viewed as a heresy in our day. That's how bad off we are, the churches in America. Christian men of old believed the city, the civil authorities should kiss the son, lest he be angry, Psalm 2. 
They sought to win the magistrates of their day to Christ or at least respect his rule. They understood that the law of God in society was needed and that civil government was supposed to be a picture of God's justice and glory in the earth, causing men to consider matters of eternal salvation. I could do sermons on every sentence I just said there. Powerful stuff. Where are we at on this thing? I've totally lost track of where I was at. Um, Amen. So, how many of you have never heard of the doctrine of lesser magistrate or have heard of it, but you don't know what it is? Okay. Well, I did talk to quite a few people, so I must have filled it in good enough. So, we'll skip this part. We'll just, that way you don't have to go back and all that kind of stuff. But the doctrine, simply for anyone who doesn't know, is that when the higher ranking civil authority makes unjust or immoral law, policy, or court opinion, the lower or lesser ranking civil authority has both the God-given right and duty not to obey, to interpose, to stop their evil, and if necessary, to actively resist the evil of the superior authority. That's what the Doctrine of Lesser Magistrate is. John Knox wrote the foremost treatise on it, In 1558, in his appellation to the nobles of Scotland, they were the lesser magistrates of their day. Citing over 70 passages of scripture, Emperor Trajan sums up the doctrine very simply when giving a sword to a subordinate one time. He said to him, he said, use this sword against my enemies if I give righteous commands. But if I give unrighteous commands, use it against me. That's the doctrine of the lesser magistrate in a nutshell. Extremely important. I want you to understand the power of a county. I want to just share with you two stories. During this whole COVID thing, we saw hundreds of acts of interposition by county and local officials, especially county officials, sheriffs, county boards, on down the line, standing in defiance of these governors, or even in some cases, the federal beast. And it was an encouragement to see. There's like 3,200 counties in America. We were able to document over 500 counties that stood in interposition. That's like one-sixth. Do you see the importance, the power of a county? The importance of a county is massive and huge. The first story I just want to share with you is about Madison County in Illinois. Madison County is a smaller county, relatively speaking, but pretty large. It's directly across from St. Louis in Illinois, across the Mississippi River, right on the Mississippi River. And remember last year, how the governors were coming out with new edicts like every 72 hours? Well, their dog governor, Pritzker's his name, he just declared that all the state of Illinois is going to come under vaccine passports about three weeks ago and is moving to implement that and already counties are beginning to gather to stand in defiance and interposition of his great evil, praise be to God. So Pritzker back in May of last year put out his latest edict and his latest edict was this, no businessman in the entire state of Illinois is allowed to open their business unless I say you can open your business and it's now a misdemeanor, not just a ticket, You're charged with a crime if you open your business before I say you can. Two days later, the little county of Madison, Illinois, the lone county of all the counties in the state, responded with a declaration stating to the world that their businessmen were free to reopen and that they would use all their authority and power within their possession to defend them and their business. Well, Pritzker, in good tyrant fashion, was very unhappy with that. And he responded in the news the next day that he was going to take away all their money that they give from the state. And he was going to make sure they didn't get federal money and on down the line. And he said he was going to wring their necks and a bunch of other crazy things that tyrants say when they're stupid. (laughs) So it was just like crazy. Well, the very next day after he put out his little rebuttal to the men of Madison, The Illinois State Police put out their own press release declaring that they would not arrest any businessman in the entire state who opened their business before the governor said he could. Amen. Amen. If not for the interposition of that one lone county, 
everyone would have remained under that tyranny. Do you see the importance of a county, the power of a county, the influence that it can have? You have to understand when America was founded, it wasn't like these guys all up here at the general or federal government, and then they came up with all these smaller governments. It all started with the smaller governments. It was a move upward. The counties were massively important to the formation. The local governments, massively important to the formation of America. It went this way, not this way. Extremely important to understand. So another story I want to tell you about is earlier this year, after Biden won, they, Democrats were all talking about taking everybody's guns and all their little crafty plans, how to disarm us without actually taking them and all that kind of thing. And this little county down in Missouri called Newton County ends up making national news because they actually passed an ordinance declaring that any federal law policy or policy that infringed upon their citizens' Second Amendment rights was null, void, and without authority in their county. That's what they did, but they didn't stop there. They also put within their ordinance that if any county official sided with the feds, they were to be immediately removed from office. But they didn't stop there. They then said that any federal agents who show up in the state to try to implement this infringement of their second, citizen Second Amendment rights would be arrested would be arrested. And that isn't without precedent. Where I'm from in Wisconsin, um, a sheriff arrested federal agents who came to our state to arrest a runaway slave. He arrested them. These are important matters. I can't get into them deeply, um, but they're exciting. Amen? Amen? So what do you do with meeting with the magistrates? One thing I've always noticed is men are always like, well, family worship, because I'm big on family worship, seems like such a hard thing to do. And then you say, well, come over and see how we do it. You show them how it's done, and they're like, that's it? It's that easy? Oh, yeah, it's that easy. And it's the same thing with meeting of the magistrates. People think it's like this big, oh, my word, thing. And it's just like, no, just pick up the phone. <laughs> pick up the phone as the first thing you have to do. You have to meet. I always tell people what I refer to as the ticked off factor. Most people need something that ticks them off, pisses them off. To get involved in civil government matters, they realize they no longer have the convenience of being indifferent towards the unjust and immoral actions of their government. So by the way, if you can't think of anything to be ticked off about, just see me afterwards and I'll help you out with that. <laughs> Amen. And with us, it's not just an anger thing. It's being broken in our hearts, repentance, because what do we see? We see God's law and word being impugned by the governments of men. And we can't be quiet. We can't just throw up a slogan of, I just expect sinners to act like sinners. No, it bothers us. We are as bad. We must act. We must intervene. We must speak. We can't just sit by. And so when you get involved, when it comes to county meetings, the these three things you all do at once, they're intermixed. Just to give you some, a few, you know, nuts and bolts. Start attending meetings. That's the first thing you do. Start attending the meetings. Someone will approach you and wonder what you're all about by the third one, if not the second. You have to get a feel for the lay of the land. You will also begin to figure out adversaries and friends. The second of the three things is research what authority your county officials possess. Look at the state statutes, the county rules. Look at history within your state. And the third thing is research and know your issue or issues, compile your facts and points, and then go to a public meeting and unload. Speak publicly at a public hearing. Amen. Understand you may have... Uh, you may have to do this before you get to do those other three things, depending on the lateness of the hour that you come to the game. Remember to stand for what's right. Speak well. Do not fear man. Do not be intimidated. Understand you will always not be liked by some men. People have to get over this thing of I want to be liked. There's a, nobody's going to like you. Everybody's not going to like you. The most liked men and men we hold in esteem now, if you read about their lives, they all had their detractors. They all had people who said bad things about them. Get over it. They will attack you, both the wicked and the Christians, and they will malign you and lie about you. But the Lord will also bring you friends. 
No, also county meetings where you can testify are during weekday, usually weekday hours, which makes it difficult. Might have to take off work. Understand that the leftists have a national county association and every state has a state county association and they like to use that for their leftist deeds because they want uniformity amongst all the counties. You know who spoke at the last national county gathering association? Kamala Harris. Okay, so that gives you a little idea. You end up with two kinds of people often at the county level, though not always, you find good people there. Two common types are straight up leftists and the other type is clueless people who become leftists by default. They don't really have a clue what they're doing or why they're there other than to feather their own nest and proffer their own prestige. School boards are similar, local government. DC's a lost cause. Have you figured out yet you're at war with your own state government too? Yeah. Have you figured out yet that the Republicans are not your friends, um, that they're not gonna protect you, that you better be faithful to Christ and you better start acting and speaking? Extremely important to do. Michael already talked about running for local office. He talked about establishing a relationship with sheriffs, massively important. They are the number one magistrate who have written to me about my book. They say it's the most important book they've ever read in their life regarding their office. Or if they're Christian, they say most important book after the Bible. Also, remember your DAs. When a county stands in inner position, the more county officials you have on board, the better. You may not get them all, you often you won't get them all, but you want as many on board as possible for the interposition that takes place. There's an excellent little book, like I get people ask me to read their books all the time. And like 95% of them, I'm like, why did you even bother? And, um, but every once in a while I get one good sent to me. And um, this one is by Ray Simmons called The Confessional County. And it goes beyond the discussion here and what we're talking about, but he has many great thoughts that you'll glean from that book regarding the efforts of building what is envisioned here in counties across America. What's being done here needs to be done in every state, in every county in America. Try to replicate it back when you go home what Michael and the men, the brothers have done here. Try to replicate it in your area, extremely important. If you wanna know what it's like to be at a public hearing, like I've done 15 months in jail for defending the pre-born. And um, I, the, the biggest downside of being in jail is you're separated from your family. And it wasn't the greatest thing. Every once in a while, you'd like to have a conversation above an eighth grade level too. You know, other than that, it's not all that bad. And, um, <laughs> but I had friends, right, who were just like, they like, I had this one friend, Bob Brown, he just thrived in jail. I was like, oh, that's a little scary, Bob. <laughs> You're a little too at home here, <laughs> you know? And, um, you know, so I, I like going to public meetings and speaking. Other people, it's like, oh, they just are frazzled and everything like that. I wanna show you a three minute video. Are you able to show them that, John? And the lips don't match, so it'll look like a Godzilla movie. But, um, <laughs> There's something that he says near the end that I want to point out to you. I just thought it was a good example. This is in Florida. They're doing a constitutional county um, or a Bill of Rights sanctuary county vote. So I was blessed to have dinner on Friday night with General Michael Flynn. And that night he, he asked me if I ever read this book before. And he didn't know I was coming to this meeting. I wasn't even sure if I was coming to this meeting today. But uh, it arrived at my house yesterday, and it is exactly on point with what this meeting is about. So I'll actually buy a copy for every one of you here. It's called The Doctrine of the Lesser Magistrates. And basically it talks about how when a tyrannical government comes in place, like our federal government is doing right now, how it is, it is the duty of the lesser magistrate, being you, the county commissioners, being the sheriff, uh, being Byron Dallas, we had all these great people show up today to show support of this because we realize what's going on in our country right now. Uh, the, the, the laws that are being passed in our federal government, what our federal government is trying to do right now is more about the social whims created by man and society than our God-given rights. Out of this book, it says that the laws of a nation should mirror the law and justice of God. And that's why our country, that's why we're living the lifestyles we are, because our founding fathers made certain that that would happen. Um, it also states in here that a state or local government in 
in the exercise of its sovereignty may reject a mandate of the federal government deemed to be unconstitutional or to exceed the powers delegated to the federal government. The concept is based on the 10th Amendment of the Constitution of the United States reserving uh, to the states and local governments the powers delegated to them, not to the federal government. So I, don't, I think this was not by chance. I think that God may have had a hand in me having this right now. And we know, we watch the federal government right now. They're, they're, they're okay with Black Lives Matter doing $200 million worth of damage and, and 30 people that have died. Like, that's okay within... The, the, with, with our, you know, the way our federal government sees things, but, um, but, but they're calling a huge insurrection uh, on January 6th. We know that they don't represent our values. And thank God we have a great county here. This, I do feel like we live in the very best place in the universe. I was just out there thanking uh, uh, Sheriff Rambos because if I had taken this stand in New York City or Chicago or other places where the social whims have taken hold instead of our God-given rights, my store would have been burnt down. I have 3,200 employees that wouldn't have a job. Every, everything would have been burnt down. And that's okay in these other cities because they're not willing to uphold the Constitution. So right now, you have a chance to show that you will uphold the oath that you took to, to uphold the Constitution of the state of Florida and of the United States. And if you don't vote to do it, then we know very clearly who it is that we need to elect out of here. It's that simple. So uh, do the right thing. Yeah. So, like, pinch yourself, right? Here's a guy at a public meeting telling the officials the laws of a nation should mirror the law and justice of God. <laughs> you know, I'm like, phenomenal, right? Infusing Christian thought into the matter at hand. By the way, I forgot to mention Madison County and Newton County that I talked to you about earlier in the resolution or declaration and the ordinance they passed. I found out later that the guy who heads up the county in Madison had read my book two years earlier and was just waiting, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to actually exercise it. Amen. And then another guy had just given the men at Newton County my book about two months earlier. One guy actually read it, and then they did their ordinance. Amen. So it's exciting to see these types of things. And did you see at the end, he said, he said, because if you don't vote for it, we'll know who to get out of here, who to unseat out of here. And um, that's exactly right, because men love to hide behind theory. The doctrine of lesser magistrate gives some practical thing to do now. If you don't stop the evil when it first comes out, then it gets down in the fabric of society and the tyrant authority always counts on their lesser magistrates to get their evil down in the fabric of society. It's when they lose that compliance, that's when the tyrant authority knows he's got a problem on his hands. Understand? And this guy here, he's a businessman, I found out later. I didn't know him from Adam. 1,200 and some employees. He stayed open during all the lockdowns that they did in Florida. So when he says, I'm going to unseat you, we're going to work to, he, they know he'll work to unseat them. Extremely important. So the doctrine lets you know who the men are and who the boys are. Who are the people with lip service, who the people are serious. Very important to understand. Um, now there's one last thing I wanted to share with you. And um, it's about judicial supremacy. And someone asked me about this right before. This will take me about five to 10 minutes to go through, but it's hugely important. You must be able to respond to the magistrates hiding behind the skirt of the federal judiciary, hiding behind the skirt of the Supreme Court. You must be able to overcome that because they love it this way. They love to tell you, yeah, I'm against the slaughter of the preborn, but the Supreme Court ruled. No, I'm against sodomy, Mary, but the Supreme Court. They, get, they love hiding behind the federal courts. They can feign a fight hiding behind the skirt of the court. We should not do that. So I want to talk to you about the idol of judicial supremacy. And the idol is found upon three fictions. And um, the first fiction is simply this. It is, I have no control over it. But you can go ahead and do the next one. When SCOTUS issues an opinion, that opinion is the law of the land. Ever heard that? Of course you have. Because they, all the lawyers in America want you to believe that. And so does the media and all the politicians. They all want you to believe that. And it's an absolute lie. It's a court opinion. It's not the law of the land. If you look at Article 1, Section 1 of our Constitution, it says right there at the beginning that all lawmaking power resides in Congress, which consists of a Senate and a House. Now, 
I got A's in every subject when I was in school except math. I always got D's, and when they brought letters in, I was done. How letters got into math, I, no. Yeah, letters are in spelling, numbers are in math. And, but even Matt Truella knows that if all lawmaking power resides with Congress, how much does that live, leave the federal judiciary? That's right, zero. They have no lawmaking power whatsoever. That's extremely important for you to understand. Skip to the next one. Um, Scalia said this when the Obergefell opinion came out, and I preached a whole sermon regarding that, that opinion. He said, Obergefell, quote, is a naked judicial claim to legislative, indeed super legislative power, a claim fundamentally at odds with our system of government. They are not to write law from the bench. They are, their opinions are not the law of the land. They want you to believe that. They even said that, said so in their 1958 case, Cooper versus Aaron. But it isn't true. In fact, all three of these fictions were declared by them. If you give someone unchecked power, any human institution unchecked power, it will corrupt itself. Anyways, here's the second um, fiction, that the Supreme Court is the final arbiter of what is constitutional and what is unconstitutional. It's absolutely false. And they say, well, the Supremacy Clause teaches us this. Well, the Supremacy Clause that they point to is Article 6, Paragraph 2, Section 2 of the U.S. Constitution, and when you actually read it, the Supreme Court's never even mentioned there. The federal judiciary's never mentioned there. You know what's mentioned there? The Constitution itself. That's what's mentioned there. That is what has the supremacy. The Supreme Court doesn't have the supremacy. Their interpretation of the Constitution does not have the supremacy. It's the Constitution itself that has the supremacy. Um, Thomas Jefferson, who spent the last 20 years of his life at war with the federal judiciary, said the Constitution has erected no such single tribunal, knowing that to whatever hands confided with the corruptions of time and party, its members would become despots. And that's what the federal judiciary has become, is despots. Absolutely. There is no single tribunal at all. Jefferson said every magistrate from the lowest to the highest, takes an oath to uphold the Constitution. That's what has supremacy. And they all understood at that time that it was under the governance of God, that if even their own Constitution violated the laws or word of God, that, would, that should be opposed. Amen. So some people are like, oh, well, you know, if we don't have this one group that decides what is or isn't, then um, what's going to happen? Here's what's going to happen. What our founders intended other branches who know that they've impugned the Constitution, that branch has impugned the Constitution, are going to stand in defiance of them. What we've created is this thing where everybody, all the legislative and executive branch, gets to hide behind the judicial branch and say, oh, well, the Supreme Court ruled. All we can do is obey. It's a lie. Here's the third part of it here. All other authorities in the nation must bow down to whatever SCOTUS issues. It's absolutely not true. They think all of us and all the other governments have to do whatever they say. And if you allow that type of a matter to exist, which we have, every human institution that has unchecked power will corrupt itself. And we've seen utter corruption. They are the dispensers of immorality and injustice in this nation. The federal judiciary, they, much of the evil they brought in this land has never been done through representative government. It's been done through raw judicial power, while the legislative and executive branches hide behind it. It's important that you understand these things and you're able to overcome them. We have writings at our website, defytyrants.com, where I go into bigger depth. I've spent massive hours researching all this stuff, talking with lawyers who I respect, which is only 11 in the whole country, by the way. <laughs> so, Jefferson said this, at the establishment of our Constitution, the judiciary bodies were supposed to be the most helpless and harmless members of the government. Experience, however, soon showed in what way they would become the most dangerous. They immediately began to assume powers for themselves not delegated to them in our Constitution. Just six years after the ink had dried in the Constitution, they did their first act to, through their court opinion, accrue powers to themselves in the federal government, not granted to them in the Constitution. That's why the 11th Amendment was passed. The 11th Amendment was passed as a response to the judiciary overstepping its bounds. 
They had 24 cases in their first 35 years, all trampling the sovereignty of the states and granting powers to the federal judiciary and the federal beast not listed or given to them in our Constitution. That's why Jefferson was at war with them. Alexander Hamilton, who was the most favorable towards the judiciary, he even said this. He said, the judiciary, from the nature of its functions, will always be the least dangerous to the political rights of the Constitution because it will be least in the capacity to annoy or injure them. They have no policing power. So they thought, okay, it'll be okay. Like your governor, when the Supreme Court says something, he shouldn't say, okay, that's now the law of the land. When a burger fell was passed, our governor, Scott Walker, the great conservative, oh, homosexual marriage is, well, he said same-sex marriage, is now the law of the land here in Wisconsin. And we'll be about, it only has any power because he didn't do his duty and interpose. And we were up on overpasses. I miss, I skipped so much of my talk. We were up on overpasses with big banners. I'm very street-minded. <laughs> I grew up in the ghetto of Detroit. <laughs> so, you know, you, you take what you have to say publicly and you take it to them privately. Not one or the other, you take it both ways to the magistrate. Anyway, yeah. Madison said this, the judiciary is beyond comparison the weakest of the three departments of power. He said in Republican government, the legislative authority necessarily predominates. So do you see what they're all saying? The judiciary was meant to be the weakest. It's all been turned on its head. It's now the oligarchy, it's now the despot. Everybody looks to them. Have you ever been there when they come out with one of their opinions? I have. Hundreds of media are there, usually thousands of people, either for or against whatever they're deciding, all waiting for the oracle to speak, you know? <laughs> to know what is right and what is wrong and how we should live. It's utter idiocy. It's not what our founders established. They established a true federalism they wanted checks and balances. They wanted multiple levels of government, multiple branches at each level to check tyranny. They have had years, centuries, Western man had, trying to understand how to stop tyranny and bloody revolutions. So they pillared these things, these safeguards, into our founding institutions. Jefferson said, you seem to consider the judges as the ultimate arbiters of all constitutional questions. A very dangerous doctrine indeed. He was writing to a man who was a judicial supremacist. And one which would place us under despotism and oligarchy. You can go ahead to the next one. He said this, the germ of dissolution of our federal government is in the constitution of the federal judiciary. An irresponsible body for impeachment is scarcely a scarecrow. Yeah, look at the history of that. Working like gravity by night and by day, gaining a little today and a little tomorrow and advancing its noiseless step like a thief over the field of jurisdiction until all shall be usurped. Okay, we've long been there. Next one. Here's what um, Supreme Court Justice Charles Evan Hughes said in 1907. He said, we are under a constitution, but the constitution is what the Supreme Court says it is. That's their hubris. That's how arrogant they are. And it doesn't matter if it's Republican or Democrat. It's not one of those issues. It's what they're taught in law school and what all the politicos have come to appreciate. It's because they gotta hide behind the skirt of the court while they pawn you off saying, I'm against it, but... Here's what Harlan Stone said, another Supreme Court justice, he actually became the Chief Justice. The only check upon our own exercise of power is our own self-restraint. They knew even then that the other branches had ceded everything to them. That has to stop. It has to be broken, and even county governments must defy the federal government. And I tell every magistrate for the last five years that I meet with, the judiciary must be defied. You cannot get around it, and you must tell them that also. And you must be able to explain to them, biblically, morally, second, historically, and third, legally, that they are on solid ground to interpose and defy the federal judiciary to defy the governor, whatever the case may be. Here's what um, this uh, Justice Richard Posner said. He was a Reagan appointee. And he, he's saying this because he believes it, not like he's chiding it. He said, it's funny to talk about the oath judges take to uphold the Constitution since the Supreme Court has transformed the Constitution in its decisions. 
The oath is not really to the original Constitution or to the Constitution as amended. It is some body of law created by the Supreme Court. You can forget about the oath. That is not of significance. That's their arrogance. And you have to teach your legislative and executive branches. You can't let them hide behind the court. You have to hold their feet. You must demand their interposition. I mentioned yesterday, a lot of people like to do an Article 5, you know, another piece of paper that another court can trample, another idiocy. We need Article 6. It's where the oath is spoken of. Every magistrate takes an oath to the U.S. Constitution and to their state constitution. And you need to hold them to their oath. I do this with the, I speak to the magistrates for the preborn. I tell them, you know, where do you see in the Constitution that a preborn baby can be killed by its mother? It's not there. Right, we know it's not there. Even the Supreme Court said it's emanation and penumbras. <laughs> you know, it's just, we just made it up, <laughs> you know. And I go, what did you take an oath to uphold? After they tell me it's not in the Constitution. They say, and what did you take an oath to uphold? And they sit there silent. And let them sit there. No one to shut up. Every good lawyer knows when to shut up. Let it sink in. Let it sink in. They've taken an oath. They need to uphold their oath. They don't take an oath of subservience to the federal government. They don't take an oath to the governor. They don't take an oath to uphold unjust and moral court opinions of SCOTUS. They take an oath to uphold the Constitution. Understand? And you must hold them. The people must hold them to that oath. And you must remove them from office when they don't. Alpheus Thomas Mason, he's not an old dead guy. He's actually still alive. He's a great historian, legal historian. He said, implicit in the system of government, the framers designed is the basic premise that unchecked power in any hands whatsoever is intolerable. Is intolerable. And it's true. That is what they believed. I'm steeped in the writings and all that kind of stuff. You can go on. 11 years after the ink dried on the Constitution, our federal government moved to in the Alien and Sedition Act to assume power is not granted to itself. James Madison, two states defied them, Virginia and Kentucky. All the Kentuckians are happy to hear that. And you should read the whole thing, but James Madison said in his, he penned the Virginia resolutions for that state. And you do remember who James Madison is, right? The architect of the U.S. Constitution is writing a resolution in defiance of federal tyranny. And he says, the states that are parties there to, parties of the U.S. Constitution, have the right and are in duty bound to interpose for arresting the progress of evil. Um, Thomas Jefferson wrote the Virginia Resolutions, and he says in part, that whensoever the general government, the federal government, assumes undelegated powers, its acts are unauthoritative, void, and of no force. We had a similar situation in Wisconsin regarding um, Sherman Booth, who was instrumental in taking action on behalf of a slave um, who had been arrested and put in the Milwaukee County Jail. I wish I had time for that old story. That'd move you to tears. But both our state Supreme Court and our state legislature defied the federal government from 1854 all the way up to the Civil War. It was a battle of jurisdictions that historians say never was resolved. And our Wisconsin legislature put this resolution amongst others forward in 1859, resolved that the government formed by the Constitution of the United States was not the exclusive or final judge of the extent of the powers delegated to itself, but that as in all other cases of compact, that's what the Constitution is, a compact of various states and the federal government, among parties having no common judge, each party has an equal right to judge for itself. That's what our founders established. It's all been lost. You have to demand it of your state officials to do their duty, your county officials, your local officials. In a society in which idolatry runs rampant, a church that is not iconoclastic is a travesty. Now, we have a travesty of a church in America. I have for a long time. If it is not against the idols, it is with, with them. If you haven't read Schlossberg, Eyes for Destruction, I can't encourage you strongly enough to do so. John Knox, he's a hero in our home. He said, shall you be excused if with silence you pass over his iniquity? Talking about the higher magistrate, the king's lawlessness, the queen's lawlessness. Be not deceived, my lords. You are placed in authority for another purpose than to flatter your king in his folly and blind rage. Amen. 
For now the common song of all men is, we must obey our kings, be they good or be they bad, for God is so commanded. You've probably never heard that, right? (laughs) Romans 13. He went on to say, true it is, God has commanded kings to be obeyed, but likewise true it is that in things which they commit against his glory, he has commanded no obedience. So when they make law that is contrary to the law or word of God, it is to be opposed. Understand that. Also understand this, when they exceed their biblical or constitutional limits, remember I talked about how you got to talk to these men about their limits? When they exceed their biblical or constitutional limits, you cannot obey them. You, there's, there's churchmen teaching, you're bound by Romans 13 in the sight of Christ to put that mask on your face. No, you're not. They have exceeded the limits of their authority. Oh, you have to plunge that needle in here. They've exceeded the limits of their authority. You stand in opposition. Christianity has always been willing to take suffering upon ourselves for standing in defiance of the state out of fealty to Christ and to neighbor, willing to take the suffering the state dishes out to the good of the nation, to the good of their neighbor. Even to the ones who think Christianity is awful, they're blind bats. I love going to the universities, talking to the young people. It's awesome. <laughs> you know, you, they're taught very limited stuff. You have to spend hours with them, and it's really good. So it's massively important. DefyTyrants.com is our, is our deal. I know I'm over time. I could say like 8 million more things, but God bless you. Thank you very much.